introduction and a warm welcome also from from my side thank you all for joining and taking the time to listen to us um, south africa i think is one of the most interesting wind markets that we have at the moment so uh, i think it's really time well spent to to join us here um, I would like to introduce um, the speakers that are with me here today and also thank them for, for joining us. Um, I have with me here today Mercia Grimbeck. She's the chair of Savea and she will um, share um, an update on the regulatory situation uh, with us and also talk about uh, some of the financing challenges that we see in the South African wind market right now. We also have with us today Wuyu Ntoy, um, Africa Infrastructure Investment Manager, um, and he's going to deep dive on the financing landscape. Um, as my colleague Carolyn said, um, please feel free at any time to type in your questions um, while we are holding our presentations and we will come to the questions afterwards. Um, with that, I would like to start actually um, taking you a bit in the helicopter and um, uh, taking you on the on the global perspective before we actually zoom into South Africa. Um, this is our um, market outlook that we released um, last week on the new installed capacity um, for 2019 to 2023. Um, as you see, um, we are predicting a fairly, I think it's fair to say, a positive outlook with over 70 gigawatts in the in the two next years, so 1920, and over the long term, over 60 gigawatts um, of new capacity around the globe for the wind energy. What you might also see here is that the African markets um, might not be the biggest markets, of course, in the in the global wind industry, but that the volume, the huge volume, actually right now is driven by, by, to, by the markets in China and the markets in, in, um, in North America. Um, however, um, what I would also highlight, and now we're getting, as I said, we're zooming in more and more towards uh, South Africa. When you take out the two boom markets, that is China and, and the US market, um, you can actually see that um, the fundamentals for wind energy are so good that we still see growth even without those markets with the with the two uh, with the two boom years. Um, and if we now again zoom uh, zoom a little bit um, more into the the African continent here, um, you see that in in light green, um, you still might want to say, okay, um, this is not the biggest share. But uh, let me detect this uh, this uh, bar chart a little bit with you. Um, we are talking here about 30 gigawatts. At the top, about 10, a bit more than 10, comes from uh, Europe and um, other mature markets outside of Europe. Then, without doubt, um, the global offshore market, especially in Asia and in North America, uh, will take off and will contribute another 10 gigawatts up and down to the um, per year to the growth of the wind market. And that actually leaves us with uh, markets in Asia, but also in Africa and Latin America that will also drive growth and volume over the next five years. And um, the main point I want to make here is that without the markets in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, but also in Africa, um, we will not achieve these growth rates that we see for the, for the global wind industry. Um, and now I said, uh, uh, zooming in more on, on the South African market specifically. Um, you see here our outlook for the African continent, and um, you also see specifically our numbers for the, for the South African wind market. Um, as we all know, um, activity level when it comes to um, installations um, is not very, um, uh, very high right now. In 18 and 19, um, we don't. In 18, we didn't see um, installations. In 19, um, we also don't expect uh, new installations and capacity. But what we do know is that there's construction activity is fairly high, and we actually expect that the market is going to pick up in 2020 with almost 700 megawatts of capacity. Um, South Africa is over two gigawatts installed, and um, we really expect. Um, 
that uh, that this market is going to pick up again. And I know that my colleague Mersha is going to talk uh, more in detail about this. What I also want to highlight here is that South Africa has been in the past a market that has shown for the African continent how to integrate and how to grow the wind industry. And I think this is why it's so important to monitor the progress in the South African wind market. Um, with that, I would like to hand over to my colleague uh, Mersha, who is going to talk more about the regulatory side. Thank you, Karin. Let me just share my screen here. There we go. So I have the pleasure of speaking about the South African economic and political environment. And really from the onset, what I would like to say is that one of the briefs for this afternoon was, is there a boundary to setting up a company when you're coming into the South African market? And I think from an administrative and regulatory perspective to start a company in South Africa, there are no real inhibitors. So the discussion topics for today is really the background to South African renewables market, what our current status is, what the challenges are currently, the political will there is for renewables in the country, opportunities we have, the future of the business, and then how do we change the current narrative to see that growth that Karin was referring to. So if we look at the background to the South African renewables market, we have in the 2011 years, totally coal-based ESCOM generation. And if we look at last year, 2018, we can see how the independent power producer market has changed that landscape and we have significantly more production from renewable sources. We've got just over 6,000 megawatts of electricity generated across the, the various rounds. And then we have 3,976 megawatts of electricity from the 64 independent um, power producers connected to the national grid. We've had just on 35,000 gigawatt hours of energy produced from renewable sources since the inception of the program. And in this scenario, wind energy represents 62% of procured generation. What we do have in South Africa is that we await the release of the updated integrated resource plan. And what we need here is, this is the roadmap for future energy generation in South Africa. We know that wind and solar is uh, really the cheapest way to produce reliable new electricity. And we can match, match that with a mix of flexible power stations such as gas fire to really give us an optimal uh, energy mix. Construction of the last round of procured projects uh, commenced in 2019 and we have commercial operation dates scheduled for 2020 and 2021 and as Karin mentioned we didn't have much activity in 2018 because we had a three-year hiatus in terms of um, government signing our power purchase agreements. The current regulatory environment is also not ideally suited to utility scale private transactions. Um, the renewables market in South Africa has largely been driven by the REAP program and we would ideally like to see a shift towards independent power producers producing energy and being able to then sell that to private purchasers and private off-takers. One positive though, is that we are seeing significantly more collaboration and discussion between government and industry. And I think this really shows a renewed interest by government to continue on the growth trajectory that we have had historically with our REAP program. This graphic really shows that solar PV and wind are now the cheapest new bold options in South Africa. Um, it doesn't make economic sense for us to carry on any new coal new bolds. And we have a decommissioning of coal power plants over the next few years. And when we look at the drop in tariffs from, for wind and solar comparative to coal, we are now cost competitive and we are able to construct and connect to the grid much quicker than any new cobalt would. So one of the challenges we have in energy production in South Africa, um, we have on a pathway to a low carbon economy and it's complicated by the dominance of a historically coal-based power generation. To shift to a renewables base, we require a stable policy environment. And as Karin mentioned, delays in policy approvals have stunted the growth of renewables and the economy in general. 
we need the continuous review of an integrated res resource plan and this really is required to adapt to an ever-changing economic market and changes in technology um, and ideally we'd like to have this plan reviewed much more frequently than it historically has been Continuous procurement is needed to derive maximum economic benefit and for that we need a supply chain that can know and understand that they have policy certainty, know that there's a continued procurement trajectory and that in itself will give the country the maximum economic benefit and boost investor confidence. Another challenge we have and it's the elephant in the room at the moment is ESCOM being both the electricity generator and the grid operator. Government is addressing this, but the pace uh, that this is going to be addressed still presents a significant challenge for independent power producers, I would say, in the next year or two. And with the energy trans transition, we need to achieve it in a just and meaningful way. Um, we cannot ignore the socio-political past of the country and if we are going to transition as a country from coal-based to renewables-based we need to be mindful that there is a coal sector that would need to be re-employed and reskilled. Opportunities in South Africa in the moment are, are there. If renewable energy is a significant contributor to the South African economy and we saw that in quarter two this year where the manufacturing sector and equipment imports grew by 6.1%. And this was largely due to the renewables um, as key drivers for this growth. And this as a result of the round four projects going into the construction phase. We need foreign direct investment and the rollout of utility scale projects in South Africa will facilitate this. Another key challenge for South Africa is job creation. We have very high unemployment rates. At the moment, it's sitting at 29%. And with the rollout of utility scale renewable projects, we have job creation that is also geographically distributed across the country in areas where there is little or no economic support. Renewable energy production also contributes to the socioeconomic development and industrialization of the country. And all of these really are foundation blocks for the growth of the South African economy. The future of businesses in South Africa is really to see a consistent rollout of renewable energies through the REAP and also a shift towards bilateral contracting private PPAs and municipal PPAs. We are in, a, in an environment where municipalities are heavily reliant on the sale of electricity to be profitable. And we need to create a legislative and regulatory environment where this is not a key driver for municipalities to be profitable. Uh, creating an environment that promotes the wheeling of electricity. The legislation is there, but the environment has never been created because of ESCOM being both a systems operator and a generator. And if we are going to split that into generation, distribution and grid management, then that creates an environment that is suitable for the wheeling of electricity and the functioning and facilitation of private PPAs. Ideally, the expansion of the South African manufacturing base and value chain. Um, you know, South Africa can once again be an investment destination for electricity intensive industries such as mining and steel. We also see South Africa as being an ideal base to export into the rest of Africa through its renewable expansion projects and to um, allow the free trade agreements to facilitate the transport of these. What we do need to see in our country is, is to change the narrative around renewables. Uh, we are coming historically from a very, very coal-based um, generation pattern. And we need to show not only our citizens, but business in general, that there is the opportunity for renewables to be a, a driver of economic growth. If only 1% of the country's land area is used for solar and wind harvesting, that would be four times the endowment of uh, size, four times the size of, of coal power endowment. The transformative opportunity from the expansion is enormous, and we can incorporate greater local deal uh, local ownership and greater job opportunities for locals. And South Africa can easily compete with, with Chile and Australia in terms of its renewables capability to provide similar low cost electricity uh, to its mining sectors. And that, Karin, and everyone else is my bit. And I will now hand over to my colleague, Vuyo, to take you through the financials of doing business in South Africa. Yes. 
Thank you, Mersha. Um, this was really, really insightful. Um, please remember to, to submit uh, your question. And will you, when you're ready, the floor is yours. Just unmuting myself there. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, uh, welcome to this presentation where we'll uh, look at financing and uh, uh, specific challenges around that uh, in the South African wind energy space. Um, before I get started, I thought it would be useful to um, introduce myself and uh, uh, the business I represent. So uh, African Infrastructure Investment Managers, or AIM, is uh, an established manager of uh, equity investments um, across the African continent in infrastructure. Um, we're a subsidiary of Old Mutual Limited, which is a, a large insurer and asset manager and has been around for the past more than 170 years. Um, our business was established in 2000 as a joint venture between uh, Old Mutual and Macquarie. Um, Macquarie's recently, uh, in, in 2015, uh, sold its stake in our business, but uh, uh, we remain a, a part of the old mutual group and we have um, assets under management of uh, around two billion dollars our business is made up of two strategies uh, one is a south african strategy uh, which uh, i'm the co-lead of and uh, a pan-african strategy that looks at um, um, investments um, outside uh, south africa or the rand area uh, we do have offices in Cape Town, Johannesburg, Lagos, Abidjan, and Nairobi. We believe that boots on the ground is important uh, when it comes to um, uh, soliciting and developing uh, investment opportunities. And uh, um, that's why uh, we're, we're well spread out uh, across the continent. Um, the South African strategy is managed under um, a fund called the Ideas Managed Fund. Um, which um, I'm the portfolio manager of, and um, it's uh, 13 billion rand. And sorry, I'll speak in rands uh, just to uh, um, simplify things, but the rand is circa um, 15 rands to the dollar. So uh, the fund size is around $880 million um, at the current exchange rate. Uh, it's an open-ended infrastructure equity fund, which has been around for the last 20 years, which is quite long for a private equity equity fund, uh, but most of our investors are pension funds and we're the largest single investor in wind and solar projects in South Africa. Uh, we have investments uh, specifically in wind in nine farms and uh, these farms have a aggregate capacity of 990 megawatts. I thought um, before I go into the financing specifically, I'd talk around um, the procurement process with Mersh, which Mersha has has covered. Um, uh, but uh, I think to maybe provide um, uh, a, a discussion around uh, the contractual arrangement. So the key part of the contractual arrangement is that um, developers build build plants, which uh, then have power purchase agreements with uh, with ESCOM and uh, the national treasury then uh, essentially underpins the obligations that ESCOM has. So when you build a project, while ESCOM is your contracting counterparty, um, your credit risk is really uh, the risk of the sovereign uh, because uh, the national treasury guarantees ESCOM's um, payments. Uh, to date, uh, 36 wind projects with uh, an aggregate capacity of uh, more than 3,000 megawatts have been procured. And uh, as you can see in the tariff graph um, above, uh, we've seen uh, quite a radical um, decline in uh, the tariffs that, uh, that uh, both wind and solar uh, have attracted in, in the various bid windows. And the main reason has been, uh, I think, the big one has been uh, technological improvements, um, also falling equipment prices, and also strong competition as um, 
players in the market have seen that South Africa is serious about uh, procuring uh, significant levels of, um, of renewable energy. And we've had foreign players come in and develop projects and come up with innovative funding solutions to drive down those bid prices. So um, it's, uh, that, that's been a, a key driver of uh, the tariff reductions, which are now at, uh, uh, or in the last round, at 62 rand cents, which, uh, um, as, as Mercia showed earlier, is, uh, is, is, is competitive and uh, well cheaper than uh, the latest round of coal power that's been built in South Africa. Um, talking more about financing, um, I think um, the, the the big takeaway from the South African market is that um, whereas in some other markets, corporate finance is a key element of um, of, of the, 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 the renewable market, um, a lot of the projects in South Africa um, are project financed. So uh, that essentially involves sponsors, not taking debt on their balance sheet, but rather uh, sponsors uh, doing uh, a financing where lenders have recourse only uh, to the project and its cash flows. Um, despite indications that corporate finance uh, would um, kind of give a big advantage to bidders and uh, um, there are various reports, uh, especially a WWF report that um, highlighted that uh, NL, for instance, had won quite a few projects in, 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 in rounds after round three. And um, essentially, uh, the belief was that they'd been able to get down to um, project returns of less than 10% in RAND terms, and largely because they were able to procure uh, cheap um, foreign uh, debt on, on their international balance sheets and use that as the basis for funding the projects in South Africa. Notwithstanding that, uh, I think project finance uh, still accounts for um, much of the market. So if you look at uh, the graph um, at the bottom of, uh, of, of, of the slide uh, on the left, you'll see that uh, on an overall basis, uh, uh, most projects, 79 uh, out of uh, um, the the total is 92 projects um, have been uh, funded on a on a project finance basis. Um, another takeaway uh, from a financing perspective is that domestic banks dominate the project finance market, and this is obviously because they're competitive in local currency. Um, we, we for the size of our economy, we have a a pretty uh, liquid uh, and uh, and competitive banking market and uh, quite sophisticated as well, um, quite a deep capital market. Uh, I mean, as an example, I think we have, we're, we're, we're probably kind of, uh, I think we're probably the 36th largest economy in the world, but um, our stock market has been um, in the top 15 previously, I think we're still in the top 20. So uh, we've got quite a deep capital market, which gives our local banks um, a significant advantage. Uh, versus foreign banks, and you'll see that uh, in our project finance market, uh, the local banks, uh, the likes of Nedbank, Standard Bank, APSA, and uh, First Rand, uh, including some local development finance institutions, have been uh, the biggest lenders into that market. Uh, from an equity investment perspective, um, uh, the, 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 there has been uh, quite a bit of uh, competition uh, and uh, from equity returns, which had a nominal level of about 20% uh, in the early rounds, um, and all these returns obviously in RAND terms, uh, we've seen um, returns on average, equity returns drop to, uh, to mid to low teens um, as a result of the increased competition and, and funding innovation. And, uh, Obviously, this is good in that it creates surpluses for, um, for, 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 for the end users. Although, obviously, there has been uh, some discussion around some of the early rounds and uh, the large tariffs uh, they were able to attract as a result of uh, uh, relatively minimal competition in those early rounds. 
Uh, so uh, yeah, there is a. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about um, some of the media discussion that's out there that uh, provides a, a challenge to 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 the funding market. I think another key thing to mention is the fact that uh, because um, the project finance market is so dominated by local banks, um, uh, reports uh, obviously a, a lot of the margin uh, discussion is confidential um, to the various projects, but uh, from round one to um, the, the latest round, we believe that uh, uh, debt margins have only decreased by um, 100 basis points. And again, this compares to equity returns, which have dropped from uh, above 20% uh, per annum to uh, the low teens. From a, an investment challenge perspective, I think uh, there are a number of challenges which abound, but uh, uh, as a big player in this market, we think that uh, these challenges are not insurmountable. Um, uh, we, uh, I think the biggest challenge we've had uh, has been policy uncertainty. Um, obviously, what you do is you build up big teams who are waiting for projects to invest in, and then uh, as happened on the round four projects, uh, there was a three year wait between the award um, of uh, preferred bidder status to PPA signature, which um, was largely due to uh, um, kind of political noise and uh, uh, arguments uh, around uh, the in integrated resource plan, which is uh, essentially uh, the, 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 the country's roadmark, roadmap in relation to energy uh, and determines how much of each energy type will be procured. Um, further to that, this delay in the integrated uh, resource plan means that the fifth round of bidding is still awaited, um, even though we had expected that uh, the bidding would have taken place by now. And uh, investors who are sitting aside um, have uh, put aside money to uh, participate in potential investments um, would, 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 would find it a bit of a problem given that uh, the, the market uh, hasn't really moved. Um, in fact, uh, it's moved very slowly since 2015. Uh, the other issue that uh, affects us from a financing or investment perspective is the poor credit environment in the sector. Uh, many of you who might be uh, aware of the South African situation know that ESCOM, which is a large monopoly um, uh, well, transmission, distribution, and generation company um, is uh, undergoing uh, serious uh, uh, balance sheet and operational issues. Uh, its uh, um, energy availability in the coal plants is growing down at a at a clip that's greater than was anticipated, and we've had rounds of load shedding. Um, it has a bloated workforce, uh, and because of its poor performance operationally and the higher tariffs it's looking for, um, you're getting into a situation where uh, many large clients are now looking to go off-grid and self-provide from an energy perspective. Um, there's still some regulatory challenges around that, but um, there has been evidence of large clients either becoming more efficient in their use of electricity or um, leaving the national grid, which is essentially the utility debt spiral where um, you know, the utility raises uh, tariffs in order to uh, ensure its survival, but um, its large clients uh, leave the grid and um, it's, it's, a, it's a downward spiral and that's what we're potentially seeing. Further to that, even uh, the Treasury, which underpins ESCOM's obligation, is on the cusp of being um, downgraded as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an invest, investment location and uh, only one of the major uh, ratings agencies has uh, the national treasury in south africa at investment grade so uh, it's it's a deteriorating credit environment and one has to really think about whether you want to take um, exposure to uh, such risk again um, given the political sublime uh, issues of public misperception around renewables um, it's either kind of a misperception that's uh, based on ignorance, or in some instances, you actually have mischief makers who've got vested interests uh, in coal, for instance, and uh, 
uh, there's been a lot of noise in the press, as you can see, around renewable energy and its impact on ESCOM and its impact on the energy market in South Africa more generally. I've also tried to highlight potential challenges that might re relate specifically to international investors. And um, as you've seen, uh, the financing sector is uh, very um, is driven by local banks, and that's because uh, the various contracts are in local currency. So uh, the sector is RAND denominated essentially, and the RAND has been very volatile of late given the credit happenings and just uh, global risk aversion. So the question is whether investors would be happy to take um, the exchange rate risk. Um, obviously, if you're a lending investor, it's easier to, um, we've got quite a deep capital market, so you could be or should be able to, um, to hedge out at risks over the long term. Uh, the other issue is for new entrants, projects are held quite tightly given uh, how hard it is to get a berth in, uh, uh, in premium projects. Um, so um, it's hard to get a berth unless you uh, put something really uh, fantastic, an offer that's really fantastic uh, uh, to, 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 to developers. So uh, uh, one has to break the stranglehold of the players who are already in the market. Um, and uh, from a banking perspective, again, just highlighting the fact that local banks um, uh, dominate the market and uh, these foreign banks would have limited scope to participate at least competitively. So that's uh, uh, kind of a helicopter view of the financing environment and uh, we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for you, um, especially on uh, elaborating how the how the outer circumstances, as I would call them, sort of influence your your way of, of working in the South African market. Um, the floor is now open to question. And since you also, Wu Yu, um, as, um, had this uh, topic actually on on the slide, and and I think this question, the first question, goes to to you, Wu Yu, but uh, also to you, um, Mercia. Um, public perception um, is there um, how, how strong is that um, I think uh, we all know that we we see that in in other markets um, how strong is that becoming a bottleneck are there for example um, initiatives to actually stop uh, wind energy or even you know to um, to stop construction or like how severe is it I think, Karen, if, if I can go first, um, there is a lot of um, misrepresentation in the marketplace by certain vested parties, um, especially those who support the coal sector. And from the South African Wind Energy Association, we really are on a, a clear pathway of, of changing the story of what renewables are and educating the general public. I think a lot of the mistrust of renewables comes from not knowing how the industry operates, what the technologies are about, and people fear generally that I might not have a job if renewables come, uh, you know, come into play. And we are very focused now on changing that narrative in the South African landscape to educate the general public that renewables are good, that we are compliant in needing to meet our commitments in terms of climate change, and that you can transition from other industries into the renewable industry, that we are open to providing skills training, especially for unemployed youth, um, but it's an ongoing process, and, and we, you can carry on speaking to that, but I think we, we really need to work hard on educating the general public to what the benefits of renewables are and what the opportunities are for people in South Africa. Yes, thank you. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm, 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 we, we are members of the various industry associations, such as we are because we believe that um, they're, 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 they're the best way to get the truth or true messages out that uh, aren't uh, driven by a vested interest, although I suppose you could say our vested interest is uh, renewables or wind. Um, yeah. it's, uh, it's, 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 it's really important to get the truth out there. I think uh, kind of social media and uh, 
um, kind of quick, quick, quick fix news and uh, fake news, you can call it, um, abound. And uh, um, it's, it's very easy for opponents to, uh, to, 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 to talk down um, mm. the sector. Um, I do think, however, um, there are genuine concerns uh, by parties in the coal sector who um, believe that jobs uh, in uh, kind of associated industries, I mean, coal transportation, for instance, um, mm. is, is, is quite a big sector uh, in the parts of the country where uh, coal is mined and uh, a lot of the power stations are located. Um, so it's it's actually about uh, taking these people along. I mean, everybody talks about uh, the just transition, but uh, it needs to be more than talk and you need to kind of understand that uh, people do really have their livelihoods at risk, but it's important to highlight that they're not at risk because of renewables. Uh, the country has made pledges in terms of um, its, its, its emissions and those pledges are going to be mat met uh, anyway. So it's, it's just that renewables form are, are, are just an alternative um, that, that gives a, a few choices in terms of where the country can go and potentially gas is the other, as mentioned by Mersha earlier. So it, it's really about taking people along, um, taking them into your confidence. Um, I mean, uh, a union that represents lots of coal truckers, for instance, is an investor in our fund. Yeah. And uh, we've gone about uh, getting them on board and uh, showing them that they have a stake, first of all, in the industry. And uh, also that uh, the industry itself is looking at uh, how it can minimize the impact on people in those industries. Great. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, gas, uh, you or Mercia mentioned gas, but Mercia, you also mentioned solar and uh, you had the slide that showed the 62 rand for wind, but also I think a similar level for, for solar. Can you um, talk a bit about the, the situation with solar and wind? Um, is there a competitive situation? How would you describe that in South Africa? I think in South Africa, it's really a complementary relationship, um, Karine. If we look at what we have, um, the wind tends to blow really early um, morning and late evening, and then we have the bell curve production of solar. Um, so whilst we historically have said that the one technology is more expensive than the other, we don't have um, restrictions in terms of available land for both wind and solar. They're both price competitive now. And if we look at a, an energy mix, there certainly is enough space for both to play in the market. Yes, thank you. And uh, maybe to, to round off the uh, the the picture here um, talking about renewables and um, we of course focus here on onshore wind but there's also the question about the potential or the plan for for offshore wind um, in South Africa I can maybe start from from my side um, GVEC Intelligence uh, we watch um, any developments very closely towards South Africa we have a um, offshore market outlook until 2030 and even though that's uh, 10, 11 years out, um, we don't see um, in that time horizon installations for offshore in South Africa. However, as, uh, as offshore is a is a um, uh, as offshore projects really take longer time, um, this uh, this doesn't mean that um, this is not on the radar of, of many people and that potential is being investigated. Um, please, Wu Yu, Mersha, if you if you want to complement to that. I think given that most of the South African coastline near shore is, is a protected environment, um, uh, and I say that environmentally protected area, so it's nature reserves around most of our near shore coastline, it does not mean that alternatives are being investigated um, sort of deeper ocean. We certainly have the wind resource if, if we look at that, and it's something, as you correctly say, won't be happening in the, in the near future, so the next 10, 11 years, but the opportunities are certainly being explored. Good. 
Um, then I would like to come back um, to this question about uh, public per perception, but also the opportunities for the supply chain in, in South Africa. Um, as we all know, um, South Africa has local content requirements. Um, can uh, Vuyu or Mersha, um, can you please share um, like what's the current status? Um, are there any considerations to change the local content requirements? Um, maybe I'd, I'd link it to the public perception issue as well, because one of the public perceptions that are being driven is the fact that you have uh, these farms that are being built with uh, and foreigners and the foreigners are taking the money offshore as a result of producing all this expensive um, renewable energy, um, which the country can't afford anyway. So that's the negative narrative. Um, the, 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 the local content, and, and, I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll look at it at, uh, at three levels, and uh, this is on the projects specifically rather than uh, uh, the rest of the value chain. So these projects tend to be located in relatively remote um, communities, which might not even have electricity to begin with. So um, you know, the worst thing is having a big power station or a big renewable power station um, located within a community where the people don't get electricity and you essentially uh, take uh, big, big cables that uh, transport this electricity to the rest of the country. So among the key uh, elements of the projects is that they're very stringent enterprise development and uh, and social development obligations that fall on the projects under the, the various bidding rounds. And um, I think more than being a, a tax, they're actually uh, um, you know, an insurance in the sense that um, they, 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 they get you community buy-in. So it's typically uh, community companies which also get a shareholding in the project um, as well, sometimes in, in, in many instances. And uh, it's kind of a, a virtuous circle where you get community buy-in into the project, um, the, the, some cash flows from the project flow into community projects, which could include uh, the provision of electricity or uh, some other service, so early childhood development or street lighting for communities that don't have it. Um, so it's also a, a means of uh, removing the negative perception around projects. Um, the second level um, uh, it, local content issue is uh, one around uh, transformation and the nature of the investors in the projects. So, and given South Africa's um, history, um, the people who take the most benefit from these projects are landowners. And due to South Africa's past, um, a lot of the landowning ownership patterns are... Um, are uh, skewed uh, from a racial perspective and while it's obviously not good to have um, uh, ongoing uh, racial quotas I think if uh, you have such a skewed environment it makes sense to introduce uh, new players and de-risk essentially the the industry by having uh, a demographic mix in the shareholdings which is why there's a requirement for um, for for black shareholding uh, in the projects and uh, I don't think uh, you know there's 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 um, funding for um, such investors, so it's typically mm. not a burden for the foreign party who's investing in the projects because there's local funding available and it's a de-risking mechanism. Uh, further to that, there's obviously a South African uh, ownership uh, requirement as well, and uh, that might change going forward. And perhaps that's something uh, Mersha is in a better position to speak about. We we haven't received any concrete um, requests for change, but what I can confirm is that the um, IPP office, who runs the renewable program, have started a process of stakeholder engagement ahead of the release of the RFP for the next round of procurement. And in that, they're not looking at just increasing potentially um, ownership, but also looking at what is practical and what is doable. Um, so 
everything that Rio has mentioned is very much mechanisms to de-risk and we will continue on that trajectory and although we might not see significant change in, in the next procurement round, um, there will be much more um, integration between and, and engagement between various industry stakeholders and, and the IPP office. Great, thank you. The local content is across the world a, a key topic, um, always, um, you know, with some concern, but uh, thank you for, for alluding here to it. Um, I want to pick up another term, uh, Mercia, that you used also in your presentation, uh, bilateral PPAs. Um, I think this is a trend um, that we from GVAC Market Intelligence actually watch very closely um, across the globe, across the markets, um, of course in the more mature North American market or also in Europe, but uh, we actually see bilateral PPAs, so a PPA um, signed between a power producer and maybe a large corporation or so to secure the energy supply, um, becoming a key driver of volume in, for example, Latin America, and um, I understand uh, Mercia also here from uh, from there's potential for for South Africa. Um, maybe you could um, could uh, talk a bit more about it. Of course, um, bilateral PPAs also need certain regulatory frameworks or certain regulatory um, uh, guidance in order to to actually happen. Um, do you think that bilateral PPAs um, could actually um, help the the wind market in South Africa to increase its volumes? Absolutely. Um, there, from a regulatory perspective, there is not anything that prohibits a bilateral market in South Africa. The regulatory framework is there um, and it allows for the wheeling of electricity so that you can have um, a wind farm producer generating the energy and a large off-taker or a private corporation purchasing that energy and using the system grid. What has been preventing it historically is the fact that ESCOM is both the grid operator and the generator. And so the administrative cost of wheeling has made it prohibitively expensive to have a bilateral PPA when you look at the cost of electricity per unit then. Mm. Um, with the restructuring of ESCOM, um, we anticipate that the systems operator would then create an environment where the use of systems grid will not be as expensive and that would create the environment for bilaterals and that would not be a long term, a long trajectory to, to achieve that goal really. So certainly there is the opportunity, there has been interest from private corporations um, already in terms of pursuing those kinds of options. And then it also creates the market for um, electricity intensive users to procure from renewable sources cheaply as well. Mm. Yes, great, thank you. Again, that's a, that's a development, a trend um, that we see in many markets across the globe. And, and I think it's a, it's a very interesting development. Um, I think uh, then uh, I would say we have a we have a final question and um, as we are um, looking towards uh, the Vindaba conference taking place um, on the 8th and 9th of October um, so in a, in a few weeks um, maybe also to you Mersha um, please share with us a little bit about sort of the ambition and then the target for for this important conference well, this is our flagship conference for the South African Wind Energy Association and we would encourage everyone to, to participate. The theme for this year really is taking wind power from South Africa into the rest of Africa. And given that we now have a willingness from a political perspective, we have a willingness from, from industry to expand renewables in South Africa and to leverage what we know and have in place from a regulatory perspective here and implement that um, across the rest of Africa. We're working with GWEC on this as well and our Africa task force to um, ensure that we can facilitate a regulatory framework in the rest of Africa that can be implemented. Um, I'm also very proud to announce that the um, IPP office, um, which is the, the body that runs the REIP uh, program, and the Minister of Energy have confirmed their attendance at this year's uh, Windaba, and they will be exhibiting as well and giving us uh, further insights into uh, next steps from a government perspective. Great. I think we're all looking, looking forward to that event. 
Um, with that, um, I would like to close the webinar and uh, thank you all for, for dialing in and, and to listen to us. Um, if you have any questions also afterward, um, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, to us on the on the GVAC page. Uh, we can also then direct questions to, uh, to our panelists. Thank you so much for taking the time here.